Let's start with the punchline. Wavelets are special. These wavelet transformations defined by these particular matrices, the analysis and synthesis matrices, well, these matrices are not um, typical. They have a lot of extra structure, a lot of extra symmetry. If you've played around with these things, you've probably noticed the various patterns in the entries. So let's explore that by taking a closer look at um, what these matrices are and what they do and where they come from. So by definition, if we consider the wavelet um, analysis matrix, uh, T sub A, it's defined to be the matrix which takes a vector X, represents a signal, and gives back a vector, the first half of whose entries describe the trend and the second half describing the detail. Now, if we think through what, the, what that means in terms of linear algebra, um, what we really are saying, I mean, if you think about how the matrix is built, uh, the top half of TA is gonna be responsible for producing S from X, and the bottom half of TA is, is responsible for producing D from X. More concretely, um, if we just think about breaking up TA as this kind of um, block matrix, so, so TA is a 2M by 2M matrix, but we can um, think about its first M rows and its second M rows as two separate M by 2M matrices. Then what you find, if you actually just kind of uh, think about how that matrix multiplication would work, if I multiplied it by some big vector X, well, the, um, the top half is given by all the dot products of the uh, rows in U by X, um, which is also the same as just saying U X, and the bottom half of the resulting vector is given by taking um, V times X. And by definition, this is gonna be the trend in the detail. And so that we see um, that the trend is given by the matrix U and the detail is given by the matrix V. Now, these matrices U and V are themselves far from arbitrary. Um, in fact, what we will find is that they are entirely determined by their first rows. The uh, top row of U, um, we're gonna call U naught, that's known as the scaling vector, and the top row of V, uh, which we're calling V naught, is the wavelet vector. So what do we mean by uh, the fact, by saying that U and V are determined by their first row? Well, what actually is going on is that U and V both share a certain kind of um, symmetry. That is to say, uh, in particular, if you look at one of the entries of U or V and you trace two over and one down, then the entry that's over there is the same. So if I were to kind of start writing things out, just for example, let's say um, that U looked like, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, you can see I'm not very creative here, uh, G, right? Then the next row of U, um, well, I'd, that would be like shifted to over. So it would be A, B, C, D, E, and then wraps around F, G, and then the next one would be shifted to over A, B, C, D, E, F, G, for example. And that's the kind of pattern that U and G always have to satisfy. So as long as you know the first row, then the next one is just go down, shift two over. The next one is go down and shift two more over. Okay. Um, so to understand why that happens, we're going to have to back up a little bit and think about the process by which these um, analysis matrices are created, namely in this process of prediction, update, and uh, normalization after a vector is split up um, into its even and odd parts. So the real core bit of these analysis matrices are these prediction and update matrices that go into them. Most of the wavelet process is a series of these predictions and updates. Of course, there's splitting in the normalization, but those are relatively easier to understand. Now, these prediction and update matrices, as we've seen, are block either upper or lower triangular matrices with identities along the diagonal, and the um, things that are either on the lower uh, little square or on the upper square, well, these are not arbitrary matrices, but as we've, as we've seen, they are constructed in very specific ways using shifts. So to be a little more precise, um, if we uh, 
think about this, these kind of presentations, the update matrices being these upper triangular, prediction being these lower triangular uh, block matrices, what are these stars? Well, these stars we've seen are um, going to be linear combinations of shifts. We've seen these at least in particular examples like the DOB4 and the CDF22 and HAR. Um, so that is to say there are things like um, maybe have some constant times the identity. Uh, you have some multiple of the shift. Maybe you have like a shift squared. Uh, maybe you have a shift to a negative power even like shift minus one for various numbers, you know, um, a minus one, a zero, a one, et cetera. Of course, I could think about I itself as like, you know, shift to the zeroth power if I wanted to. Um, but in any case, these are um, particular expressions in the shift matrices. We call such an expression a uh, Laurent polynomial. Uh, in the variable s. So if I think about s as like a formal variable like x or something like that, if I were to like um, just temporarily like ignore that term right there, did I highlight it? I should, I, I want to say ignore it, ignore it, ignore that. Well, I don't know how to erase it. Okay. If I just, uh, if I want to say ignore this term over here, then it looks kind of like a polynomial in the variable s. Um, a Laurent polynomial means I have a polynomial, but I'm allowed to have negative powers as well as positive powers. Okay, anyways, so these, these expressions that are in the stars are Laurent polynomials, and they represent just ways of, you know, shifting your, um, these con constituents of your signal left and right. Um, so this is what the star is, both for the S's and the P's. Of course, the diagonal part, uh, the normalization is some diagonal matrix. Um, which just has some scalars times the identity, scalars times the identity. And then of course there's the split. But what one gets in the final analysis is that the analysis matrix um, looks something like this. Well, we know it's a diagonal times um, a bunch of um, U's and P's. By the way, that U is different than the other U before that was on the top of the matrix because this U is a Roman U and the other was a calligraphic U. So please be careful. Okay, so D times a bunch of Us and Ps. And then I have uh, my split matrix. And this is the structure of TA. Now all this stuff together um, is just a product of these matrices whose entries um, maybe our scalars times identities, maybe shifting here, shifting there. At the end of the day, what you get is this thing is some sort of a matrix um, whose entries I will write as P00 of S, um, P01 of S, P10 of S, um, P11 of S, where these Pijs uh, of S are just expressions, they're Laurent polynomials in the variable s. And so my analysis matrix has the form of, um, the, uh, of these Laurent polynomials in the shift time split. Um, and that's a very useful form for us. I want us to keep in mind that we've actually seen these matrices before, matrices of this, of this sort. These linear combinations of the shift are known as circulant matrices. We've looked at them in more detail when we were considering the fast Fourier transforms or the discrete Fourier transforms. So let's take stock of where we are right now. So we have uh, these two different ways of thinking of the analysis matrix. We can think of it either as a, a block matrix, the top part of which is responsible for the trend and the bottom for the detail, or we can think of it as a product of this matrix whose entries are Laurent polynomials in the shift so-called circulant matrices, times the split. And now, what is it that we're exactly trying to prove? We're trying to understand a certain symmetry that these U and Vs have. And it might be convenient to think a little bit about um, how to formulate these a little bit more precisely. So the symmetry property in plain English is that if we shift the rows down one, that's the same as shifting left two. Okay, let's let's draw the picture here. I mean, the way I said it before, 
is that if we look at um at this kind of a, a picture here then if you go over two to the right and down one that looks the same but you can also think of that as saying that if i take this picture and i shift it down by one if i shift the rows down well so in other words this a goes down to where the d is the b goes down to the e is the c goes down to the a, everything shifts down well i don't know what exactly i get on the top right now because i didn't draw a row above my first row but I know that in my bottom row, I'm going to end with an A, B, C, D, E. Okay. If I'd drawn a bigger matrix, then I would see what's up there. But um, now let's think about what happens if I shift left by two. Well, if you shift left by two, then in this bottom row, the A goes two to the left and ends up where the D is uh, right here, which is, of course, what happened back there. Uh, the B goes back where the E is, so it's right there, et cetera. And of course, I can also see what happens in my first row. The C goes back to the A, the D goes back to the B, et cetera. I got this thing. If I drawn it a little bit bigger, it would be a lot more convincing. But the point is, is these two guys um, line up. You know, really, what we're saying is that, um, you know, if I if I on the one hand um, go down one, or on the other hand I go left two, then these guys kind of meet in the middle. So those, you know, that's uh, doing the same thing. All right. So. Um, what we then would like to know is that taking a matrix and shifting left two is the same as down one. Okay, I can say that, but it would be nicer to say this in terms of these uh, shift matrices that we are um, becoming so fond of. So let's um, reformulate these in terms of those shift matrices. So um, a nice way to see what's going on is to consider um, both right and left multiplication by the shift matrices. As we've seen before, the definition, the basic idea of the shift matrix is that, um, is that if you take the shift, the M shift matrix and you multiply it by a vector of length M, then everything moves down by one. That's, that's how it's supposed to work. What if you take a shift matrix um, and I multiply it on the right by a vector instead of on the left. So we're used to taking a matrix and multiplying it by the um, by a column on the right, but now I'm going to multiply it by a row on the left. So let's take a look at what that does. So we could think hard about this, but let's not think too hard. Let's just do it, right? I mean, we know what the shift matrix looks like. It uh, it has this explicit form. The first basis vector goes to the second basis vector, the second goes to the third, et cetera, and that is the shift matrix. And now I can work this out just by doing a little, you know, multiplication. So if I take this vector and multiply it by uh, this first guy, then that tells me what my first entry is, and you can see that it's Y1. If I um, take, if I take um, my vector and multiply it by my second, uh, column, then I get my second entry, and you can see that that's a y, uh, you know, zero, uh, sorry, it's a y, uh, zero, one, two, y, two, etc. And as you can see, when you do this matrix multiplication, you go all the way up to y, uh, 2m minus one from this second to last thing, and then from the last one, you get a y, zero, excuse me, you get a you get a y zero. And so what you find is that um, multiplying by the s on the right is like shifting left instead of shifting right. And that's going to be a useful fact. All right. So when we skip up from vectors to matrices, we, um, you know, because of how matrix multiplication works, I can think about left multiplication by a matrix as doing this same operation to each of the columns of the matrix. And in particular, um, each entry gets shifted down by one when I left multiply by SM. And similarly with right multiplication in columns, the columns get shifted to the left. And so all the entries get shifted to the left when I right multiply by S 2M squared. And so what we want to show, and this will be for both U and V, that if you um, shift down one, then that's the same as shifting left two. So this is the fundamental property of these matrices U and V that we would like to show. And we'll take a look at that right now. So our goal here is going to be to show for both of these matrices U and V, that if you multiply on the left by SM, in other words, you shift their rows down, then that's the same as multiplying on the right 
by s2 m squared, in other words, shifting to the left too. Now, um, the checking this is going to be a relatively uh, long but somewhat straightforward uh, computation. So what we do is we consider um, this matrix that contains the ingredients uh, which we are interested in. We can think about that matrix as taking this block diagonal matrix of shifting uh, of, the, of the shift matrix and multiplying it by this um, block uh, two and by two in matrix UV. Of course, that just has the effect of looking at of having SMU on the top and SMV on the bottom. And we're really interested to know how we can rewrite that, hoping that we can rewrite it and see something like this at the end of the day. Okay, so we can, um, we can rewrite this UV matrix um, by remembering that it's the analysis uh, wavelet transform matrix. And we can write it as this matrix whose entries are Laurent polynomial in the shift times the split. Okay. Now I can take that, um, I can take this uh, block diagonal matrix and multiply it right inside this one. And that just has the effect of multiplying each of the entries by SM. And so that's what I have here, SM times the various entries. For the next step, what we remember is that our matrix is circulant. And what that means is that, um, or these individual block matrix, blocks of the matrix are circulant, these P's, the PIJ of S's. And in particular, what that means is they commute with shift. Um, I said of S, but all these S's are really the same SM. This, you know, this is the, the shift of an M by M dimensional vector space basis. Okay. Now, um, so that means that I can move those SMs or S's, however we want to call them, past those uh, entries. And I can pull them right on out the other side because that's uh, also matrix, how matrix multiplication will work on the other side. And so um, I am left with, um, with this expression uh, down here. And what we need to show now, so if I were to just bring this down so I can kind of see everything on the same page, same bit, this stuff down there. So this is the expression that we, that we have. And what we really want um, is that um, what, what, we'll, what we'll in fact be able to show is that if we have this SM, SM times the split, then we can actually move that guy past the split by sticking an S um, um, 2M, um, which one do I want? Um, yeah, but sorry, yeah, S 2M uh, squared on the other side. So in other words, um, moving the um, this um, moving these uh, this block diagonal SMs past the split switches it with an S two M squared. Okay, but if I do that over here, I get this same matrix split S two M squared. So ditto marks there. And what would that give? Well, we'd basically be done at this point. We'd have SMU, SMV would be um, this whole deal, which we know as the analysis matrix, which we can also write as UV, times S um, 2M squared. And of course, when we are um, right multiplying by, um, by a matrix, that is the same as kind of matrix multiplying each of the columns. And so I can rewrite the right-hand side um, as, um, as U S uh, 2M squared, B S 2M squared, and then equating the top and bottom halves, we'd be done. The only thing, to understand is this thing, which I have um, just claimed, which is that if you move this block SM past the split, then that's like SM, S2M squaring on the other side. So what is that about? Well, this last part is actually very intuitive if you, um, if you think about it. I mean, what we're really saying is that if you take a signal and split it into its even and odd parts, 
then you can, and then you shift both the even and odd parts down, then that's like taking the original signal and shifting it twice and then splitting it up. If you think about it, I mean, really what's going on, if you shift the even part of your signal, that's like taking the zero to the two, the two to the four, the four to the six, you shift the odd part of your signal, it's doing the one to the three, the three to the five. Well, really the indices are moving by two. So um, if you were to, um, so you, you can do that same action by first shifting twice and then splitting up your signal. And that's really the point of this. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, finish this off and just take a look at it. We wanna show that, um, that if you first split your signal up and then shift each the even and odd parts of it, then that's the same as shifting your original signal twice and then splitting it up. You can just see it, we can just check it, right? If I take my if I take my signal X and I first split it up, so here I've written it like this, so this is the effect of doing this on some vector X, and then I shift each part of it, well, you know, the, um, the 2M minus 2 gets shifted up to the beginning, the X naught gets shifted down, the X2 gets shifted down, all, and so this is what I get down here, and similarly on the odd part, my X1 moves down, the 2M minus 1 moves up here, X3 goes down, et cetera. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I could work out what happens on the right-hand side when I apply to some signal X. And, well, what happens? Well, you apply the twice shift to your signal X, and, well, that you shift it down twice, so the 2 and minus 1 goes up to the top, and then it goes down 1, 2 and minus 2 trails right behind it, and then you get the X naught and the rest. And what happens if you take that and you split it up into the even and odd parts? Well, uh, you can see that this thing, which is now in the zero place, gets stuck in the beginning. I skip down two later, and the x0 is the next thing that goes in there, and then x2 is the next thing that goes in there, and this is the first odd thing that goes there, and oh my gosh, these are the same thing. And um, so we're done. We have now shown that if you move the split past these, um, these shifts, you get this identity that tells us that, um, that we can conclude that, uh, that these guys are, are equal. We get this property of, um, of the U and the, and the V, which says that when you shift things down, it's the same as shifting them left to in these, in these vectors, which says that U and V are determined by their first vector by successfully shifting down and over two. And we then find the importance of these first vectors in the uh, top and the bottom half called the scaling and the wavelet vectors respectively. If you think about it, this really says that if somebody just says, I'm thinking of a wavelet transformation and here is my scaling vector and here is my wavelet vector, well then you can write down the, uh, you can write down the analysis uh, transformation, you can write down the wavelet transformation. Everything is determined from two given vectors.